So I said, okay, I'll ask you. Yes. So I just want to walk away. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, what would you like to be when you grow up? Uh, I like to be a doctor. A doctor? Yes. Why? Doctor. Why? Uh, because uh, here in, in Cape Town, in Billy, there are no doctors like where uh, we live now. Uh, and then I want to help uh, the community. Yeah. Okay. And what are your favorite subjects at school? Uh, it's made from science. Okay, and you're yeah. doing biology as well? Yes. Oh, okay, because you must do one of those three to become a doctor, you know that? Yes. Okay, and then, um, what do you like to do for fun? For fun, I like, uh, I like to do a campo dance. Oh, so you're part of the cultural program? Yes. Oh, all right. And if you could be anything for, what, for one day, what would that be? Uh, for? If you could be anything, for one day, what would you do? Uh, I would be happy for that day. You are happy for that day? Yes. <laughs> okay. That's a very good answer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Bravo, for chatting to us. Thanks. And we'll see you next year and we'll do the career day. Thanks, okay. man. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that was a little bit of inspiration for you guys to start off with. Um, I'm trying a new experiment today. Where what I'm doing is I am recording my lecture, um, and then I will make it available online, so that if you want to go and um, look at something again, or if you didn't understand something the first time, you can go and look at it again. All right. Also, in the, on Monday, I was very ill. I'm still ill. I've got the flu. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really lecture in detail. So I'm going to make it available for the Monday people as well so that they can also just get the proper lecture. So if I pass out or if I start talking incoherently, then you know it's the flu talking. All right. <coughs> Oopsie. That was the bag. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be talking about project initiation. Um, please sign the attendance register and write your group number if you have a group number. If you're still battling with um, getting a group and getting a group number and getting reg registered on my tutor, don't worry about it, we'll sort it out um, when we start doing the, the, the group work which we will do just now. Okay, so today we're talking about project initiation. <coughs> so the main outcomes is that we want to be able to develop a list of stakeholders and we want to be able to develop a project charter. So, why do you think it's important to identify project stakeholders? Can everyone please just switch their cell phones to silent? Why do you think it's important to identify project stakeholders? Sorry, Sanjo, can you speak up? I didn't hear you. Okay, so we want to know um, everybody that would influence our projects. Why do we want to know everybody that would influence our projects? Kenny. Sorry? So, uh, for the sake of involving them to meet the goals, okay, um, Jeremiah. Because by excluding them in the process, we're going to have a problem of not finishing our project. So we need to involve them when we start meeting, and then we have to have a concrete information so that when we start a project, we know exactly what really the, 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 the client is looking. For. 
because even the, the, the client as well as the, the, the managers or the sponsors are the one who actually keeps us going and we must know what is really okay all right so if you remember our little picture of the of the tree and the swing um, we need to involve all the stakeholders so that at the end of the day we deliver what the client actually requires all right okay but so now how do we go about identifying project stakeholders um, so the first question is what are project stakeholders I've asked you why are they important but what are they? Who are they? Who, who are these animals? Yes, speak up, please. Sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, so they're people that can influence the outcome of your project. Yes, Yvonne? Okay, and those that are influenced by the project. Okay, so I would love this guy to be my project stakeholder. You can see he's holding the stake and he can come and bry at my house any day. Although my husband might not be so happy. <laughs> okay, but so <laughs> the ones in, in, in one of the interviews two years ago, um, I asked the question to one of the students, what is the project stakeholder? And um, they couldn't answer the question. So I said, is it the person that holds the stake at the braai? And my colleagues have been te teasing me about that since ever since. <laughs> right, so a stakeholder is not the person holding the stake at the braai. <clears throat> so if I ask you that question in the test or in the exam, don't give me that answer. This is the answer I want. Um, so it's the person or organization that forms part of the project team. All right, so, it's a, so sometimes we forget that the project team is actually also a stakeholder and um, or has vested or perceived interests that can be affected by the project. Can somebody give me an example of a, a very recent project that's in the news at the moment where they got the stakeholder management completely wrong? Tolls, yes. Okay, we all <laughs> um, we all know that. Okay, so so the the, the, the problem was with, with Sunroll is that we as the consumers have vested interest in the project because at the end of the day it's going to um, affect our pockets and they did not manage us from the beginning. They built the beautiful roads and whatever. And then one day, suddenly, we found out that we had to pay a fortune in order to use the beautiful roads. Okay. So they got their stakeholder definition wrong. And can you see that we're talking about project initiation and stakeholder definition is one of the first things that we do. So right at the start of the project, we do our stakeholder definition. Okay, so here, are, um, here is just a list of typical stakeholders that you will find on a project. So clients, customers, owners, or other recipients of deliverables. So we can call those beneficiaries as well. Well, some of them, uh, recipients of deliverables, are definitely beneficiaries. Okay, so in the Sunroll project, who are the beneficiaries? Yes, car owners. car owners are supposed to be the beneficiaries. Who are the beneficiaries at the moment? <laughs> the people that are pocketing our money. Okay, so there has to be an equitable um, uh, uh, return for, for all of the beneficiaries in the project. Um, the end users, which in this case is also, for Sunroll, is also us and the beneficiaries, um, functional managers, project managers, senior managers. So this you can see is part of the um, 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 the, the, the project organisation. Then financiers or sponsors, joint venture partners, because a lot of of these really large projects are done with joint ventures. 
um, environmentalists and environmentalists are often those that can oppose our projects and can make our projects fail if we don't manage the environment and the impact on the environment of our projects properly. Then uh, society at large and that's where um, <coughs> projects can also sometimes fail if you forget that there might be an impact on society at large and society at large might um, come and toy toy against your project if you don't manage them uh, right from the beginning. And then the project team members. So in the final analysis we can take all of these project stakeholders and we can classify them as beneficiaries and supporters. So those are the people that are on our side that want our project to succeed and who will benefit from our project. Opposing parties, so these are the guys that don't want the project to succeed for whatever reason. Sometimes that would be for political reasons. Um, then we have team members and other contributors because the team is the core team of the project. But remember that we sometimes subcontract parts of the project and we sometimes get sponsors for parts of the project. And so they would be part of the contributory bodies. And then the last one is the regulatory bodies. Now, um, it's important to understand that regulatory bodies are people with teeth or bodies with teeth. Okay, so they can bite us. They can do something, um, fine us. They can basically stop our project. Okay, so... Typically, if, if you think about building, a building inspector um, is part of a regulatory body and if they come and inspect your building and it's not up to standard, um, they can make you break down what you've built up to there and, and redo it. Okay. The important thing to note as well, which I find that, that the students, especially when you guys do your individual assignment don't realize is that um, a standard is not a regulatory body okay so um, the ISO standard is not a regulatory body the regulatory body is the body that enforces the ISO standard in the organization okay so if if you are ISO certified and um, your project has to meet a certain ISO standard, who, who enforces that ISO standard in your organization? Do you want to give me some examples? So the quality auditors, yes. Any other examples of who enforces the ISO standards on your project? Sorry, Sapiwe, can you talk up? Okay, it could be the municipality. Yes. 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 Okay. But so the, the point I'm trying to make is remember that a regulatory body is somebody with teeth and it's not a piece of paper because a piece of paper can't bite you. It can only give you paper cuts. Right, um, and a regular a regulatory body is like a crocodile that has teeth. Okay, so in the Gau Train project, which of the following would not be stakeholders? Tourists, tourists to the USA from Europe, homeowners near the Gau Train route, the project team, the South African public. Hi. 
Wel, sal jy omgee as ek asjeblief van oogend aangaan, want ek is voor ek voel baie sêk, ek het, ek het griep. So ek wil net klaar maak en huis toe gaan. Ek is baie jammer. Maar as my jylle stoot het door mekaar. Um, <coughs> en ek sê, ek sê vir die vir die studente, please confirm with uh, professor Ben. Sorry? I'm going to lecture today until 11 and then Mr. Heinemans is, is going to lecture. Um, it just means that some of the group work that you were meant to do in class, you're going to now have to do outside of class. So you can always stay afterwards and, and do your group work. Okay. Um, Alright, so have you guys decided? Does anybody have a, a different number? Why is it number one? Okay, cool. Uh, for the Soccer World Cup, the following were stakeholders. Soccer players, South African citizens, German supporters, Nelson and Num Mandela, all of the above, none of the above. Okay, so, so who says it's one? Put up your hand. Two. Three. Do you say two? Okay. Three. Okay, four. Five. Okay, so the majority say it's five. Or I, I didn't say six. Six. Okay, so South African citizens were stakeholders. Because it was about our country and it was about how our country was um, um, being marketed. Uh, German supporters definitely were stakeholders because they came all the way from Germany to come and support. And um, if you remember um, on the news there were pictures of these huge uh, screens that they put up all over Germany for German people to go and watch the games, etc., etc. Nelson Mandela definitely was a stakeholder. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't at the opening match, but he was at the closing match. And he's like one of the arc icons of South Africa, and he definitely was a stakeholder. Was Sorry? Uh, he was part of the negotiating team. Yes, and he was part of the negotiating team. And he's part of South Africa. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, so that's a very um, interesting remark, you know, is that sometimes... Um, <clears throat> Sometimes something like South African citizens is a very broad concept and Nelson Mandela is also part of that. But sometimes we would like to um, take him out and, and make him a specific stakeholder because he has to be specifically managed differently than what we would manage 
the South, uh, uh, the, the South African citizens. Okay, because remember we identify stakeholders because we need to know who they are so that we can manage them. All right. Okay, so then we categorize them according to beneficiaries and supporters, opposing parties, team members and other contributors and regulatory bodies. And we've already discussed that on the slide and you will see on the handout that I'm going to give you a little bit later um, the, uh, you know, when you, when you put this into uh, your charter or into your project plan, it's easy if you just use a, a table like this because then everybody can see who are the stakeholders and what is their impact or effect on your project. Okay, so when building a house, the municipality would be a beneficiary or supporter an opposing party, a team member, a regulatory body. Who says it's one? Two. Three. Four. And the rest of you? <laughs> okay, so do you see that... The municipality would be the regulatory body because they come and check if everything is fine and they can bite you because they can make you break the thing down if it's not fine. But, but they would also be a beneficiary in the sense that, remember from a rates and taxes perspective, um, they would benefit financially. Yes, but that's a long term, that's, that's a beneficiary of the product. Yeah, so and that's that's long term and, and what we want to know is for our project, which is now, how does this work? Hi. Okay, on the going to Mars program, the Mars lander team would be a beneficiary or supporter, an opposing party, a team member, a regulatory body. Okay, so who says it's one? Two Three, four. Okay, there's some people here that don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm meant to have clickers for these questions, um, but I haven't got the clicker software, so I must just get it, and then from next time we'll do it with clickers. Come in. Okay, so it's a team member because they are the team that is making this project happen. When building a nuclear power station, Greenpeace would be a beneficiary or a supporter, an opposing party, a team member, a regulatory body. Okay, so who says one, two, three, Four. Okay, so Greenpeace is not a regulatory body because they don't have teeth. They are a, a non-government organization and they mainly um, oppose things like um, nuclear power stations by protesting, etc., etc. But they have no teeth in terms of the law. All right. And so that's why they would be an opposing party. Okay, so are there any questions so far around stakeholders? No questions. So, so you're all fine, you're all going to be able to identify stakeholders easily. Okay, so guys, I want to just um, talk to you. We said that um, we're going to do the career day at Cliptown Youth Project. Um, subsequently, on Monday, the because um, look, there's the, 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 the evening class on Monday, and then there's you guys on a Friday. And on Monday, there were eight groups, and they have pr pretty much covered a very wide spectrum of careers already. And so 
I was wondering whether it would be okay with you if instead of taking you guys to Clip Town, we go to Haman's Kral. Because I have um, contacts in Haman's Kral as well, and we can set up um, a career day, we can get a wall there and, and everything. Okay, so is there, um, who, who would vote that we, that we go to Haman's Kral? What I will then do is I'll go there and I'll get some photographs and some background information for you there as well. Um, and then th we will then go on the 27th of July because classes start on the 20th and in the second semester um, there are only classes every, t well for you guys there's classes every second week so the week in between on the 27th we will then go to Haman's Kral. Okay, um, who, who votes yes that you want to go to Haman's Kral that it's fine? Okay, who doesn't? Who doesn't want to go to Haman's Kral? Okay, fine. So, so um, I, I just thought that then our, our project actually makes a contribution in two, in two communities. And um, it then again gives you guys the opportunity to choose careers that, that you want to choose. Um, because otherwise I, I would have to put up the list of what has already been chosen and you would then have to fit in with that and I think that's not very fair. Okay. All right, so for, for you guys, the clip sound will now change to, to Haman's Kral. Um, I haven't changed it yet on the charter, um, but at this stage, the, the, um, at, at the high level planning stage, it's not really that much different. Okay, and so when we go into the detail level, I will get the detail level information. Okay, <clears throat> all right, I'm, I'm going to skip this for now um, because we're going to look at the, the high-level charter which I've written which has uh, the stakeholders and um, then you guys are going to spend some time in your groups looking at um, the, the, the stakeholders and all the other things that are in the, um, in the uh, project charter. Okay, so a project, yes? Just to spell out the word to you, um, with regards to the group assignment, wouldn't it be easy and, and non confusing that probably you identify a list of these careers and then we can just choose from them? Because of 10 to 1, we, a particular group might decide to choose not knowing what the other group has yeah, chosen. What, what, we, what we did on Monday night, and w we'll do that now as well, is I wrote all the group numbers on the board. And then the groups discussed what they wanted to do. And then as they decided, we put it, uh, th they put it down. All right. So you could then see what the other groups had already decided. And there was only one group um, the, that said engineering, and they wanted to do engineering as a whole. And then there was another group that said civil engineering. And then we decided that the group that said engineering as a whole had put down their names first. So they got to engineering, and then the other group had to change. So, so that worked quite well. There wasn't any, any contention or, or problem. Okay. So I'd rather that you guys talk in your groups and be comfortable, um, and then the race is on to get it on the board. All right. Okay. So that, that worked in the, in the evening class, and I'm sure it will work here as well. Okay. So um, <coughs> a project charter. What, what is a project charter about? A project charter tells you who are the major participants in your project. It gives you the high level scope of the project. So you can see that's a telescope. It's not a microscope. Right, so in the project plan, that's where we start doing the detail scope. Whereas in the project charter, we have the high level scope. Then we want to know what the objectives are. So what are the targets that we, are, that we want to meet? We want to know how are we going to measure that we're meeting those targets. And that's a very important one, which people often forget. Um, and why projects often fail is because we don't say from the beginning how are we going to measure whether the project is a success or not. And then 
the assumptions or restrictions. So what's, what do we assume will be in place and what are um, the boundaries? So what are the things that might stop us from attaining what we want to attain? All right, and then at the end of the day, what the project charter does is it gives the project manager the authority to continue with the project. So what you guys are going to do is you are going to write a project charter for each of your stalls. You're going to submit that project charter and I am the, the CEO and I am then going to sign off and say yes, you may um, con continue with the project or say no, this project charter isn't acceptable. You have to update it before you're allowed to continue with the project. Okay, does that make sense? So what criteria are going to be used in order to say no? <coughs> okay, the criteria are already loaded on my tutor. Um, so basically, you need to get 50% for your charter. Otherwise, you will have to redo it. Um, we, can, we can look at it now, now, in, yeah, in so detail. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we've now already talked about what is a project charter, but the, um, the picture I want you to have is the map of the world. Right, so it maps out on a high level to you what the project is. So on the map of the world, this one, we, we, we know, we can see there's a land mass here, but it doesn't tell us that that's South Africa yet. Okay, because when we get to the detail planning, that's when we're going to say that is South Africa. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So your project charter is high level. It's not a long document. Um, the one that I wrote for the high level planning is a three page document. Okay, so it's not um, pages and pages and pages because the detail comes later. The detail comes when we get to the project plan. So it's used to obtain approval from the company CEO as well as funding from outside organizations, for example, the government. Therefore, all stakeholders and role players and each one's individual objectives must be taken into, into consideration. And for your stall that you are um, uh, designing, you might uh, consider getting sponsors somewhere. And so you can use the project charter to, to go to the sponsors and say, you need, you know, we need a few um, hundred rand or a few thousand rand so that we can make the stall as nice as possible. All right. So always keep that in mind when you write your project charter. Okay. So it's the definition of what and whom and the justification of why. So... What are we doing? For whom are we doing it? And why are we doing it? <coughs> Hi. I just want to check this keyboard at the back. Okay. All right. So um, here are the main components of the project charter. I'm not going to talk through them now because I will open the... Um, the handout and, and then we can talk through it in a bit more detail. Okay, so we've now got to the handout part. So, okay, at this stage I'm going to stop the recording. No?